Well, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Uh, it's been a terrific discussion. Um, I think before we end in the last few minutes, um, just a few final thoughts uh, about uh, neuroendocrine tumors, where we've been, where we're going. Um, Phil, let, let's start with you. Any concluding uh, thoughts about the past few years and what we might be seeing in the well, down the road? Well, I think I think the shift now is for therapy. We have a lot of different tools in our toolbox now. Not only different types of you know chemotherapeutic agents and biologic agents, but even intraoperative and perioperative type of agents. Uh, irreversible electroporation, the quote nano knife. We have all types of ablating instruments, microwaves and radio frequency ablations. We have embolic therapies of all kinds. And so I think sequencing of all these different therapies is important. It's important for us to learn the right sequencing. And, and the only way we're going to do that is to probably pool our data. Um, I do think that patients should be, I think patients should get their second opinion first. And they should go to some type of a tertiary center that has a dedicated neuroendocrine team with a neuroendocrine tumor board to help the clinicians sequence all these different options since there are so many. I think that surgical resectability is a moving target. I'm certainly doing operations today that 10 years ago I would have said were not operable. Um, and so as our skill sets improve and our tools improve and our anesthesia gets better, that also is a moving target. And so patients that were, because they live a long time, we are now seeing patients that we, even in our own center we deemed inoperable some years ago have now come around again and say, well, I'm still here, now what? And now they have been rendered operable to where you can significantly debulk their tumor and, and I think improve their quality of life and, and add some years to their right. life. So I think it's, I think it's reevaluation is important, active surveillance is important, whether you're pre-op, post-op, or somewhere in between. Um, but all these different modalities really do need to be looked at and monitored and looked at and monitored. And, and, and you have to be in for the long haul because they're going to be around a long time if we play our cards right. And it's a good thing. Absolutely. Pam, final thoughts from you. Um, you're skipping around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, I'll echo the excitement. I'd say in the last five years, it's been a really exciting time to be a, a clinician and a researcher in the field to have options for patients, and in particular, options for patients that I had five that I've been treating for five years to say, look, the research that we've done actually will directly impact you. Um, I think a, a wish of mine for the for the future is to find better. Um, predictive and prognostic markers. I think that's a real lack in this um, field, so I'm, I'm hopeful for that. And Pam, uh, excuse Diane. me, Diane. <laughs> okay. We do that. Like <laughs> You're not the first to have said that. <laughs> um, but that's a very big compliment. Thank you very much. Right, absolutely. Um, I, I think I would echo um, what everyone said. I think the disease management team is absolutely critical in this patient population. I do think that as the incidence rises, we have to be very careful on when we're treating. I don't think it's an if we treat, but when we treat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I completely agree that you know surgery will play a role, but in whom we don't know yet. Um, and I just get very nervous that you know in patients that um, are going to do well in spite of us, <laughs> we have to be very careful that the morbidity associated with certain treatments and certain modalities um, is lowered as, as much as we can. Because I think this patient population is is very unique and. Unfortunately, we don't have the sequencing data. and We don't have um, treatments to or data to compare these different modalities. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it really is based on clinical judgment. And that's very unsettling for patients when they may get five different opinions from five different people. Yeah. So um, I try my best to uh, allow data to drive my clinical decisions. But I would be the first to you know, um, say that sometimes we just don't have the data. But we're working on it. And Rod, you get the last word. Gee, to follow five experts and come up with something <laughs> that hasn't been said. Um, yeah, I have to echo everything everyone else has said, but you know, keep in mind that you know, this is like Alice through the looking glass, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, we have to wear a different hat with these kinds of tumors because they are so special and so different. And um, I think it's a very exciting time to be involved in this disease. For many years, we'd all go to the meeting and <clears throat> what's new with you? Not much. Uh, see you next year. Uh, and now we are designing trials, putting them together, pooling our data, asking the next question. And 
uh, instead of you know shooting from the hip, we actually are doing data-driven mm -hmm. work, mm -hmm. and uh, we've all pushed the fronts forward together, and I think we can all be uh, amazingly proud of that, and we intend to keep doing so. Absolutely. Well, I absolutely concur. It's been an incredibly exciting time, and I think it will be exciting in the future. Uh, so on behalf of our panel, uh, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us.